Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome to the Kingston Environmental Advisory Forum. Um, as this is the inaugural meeting, I will be um, kicking this one off as the clerk in order to do the election of officers. Before doing that, I wanted to um, quickly welcome Emily Monroe to the committee. I don't see that she's joined us yet, but I hope she will be in attendance this evening. Um, she has uh, recently been um, appointed to the committee uh, by council, so we welcome her as a new member. Uh, also, um, before we get started, I'm going to confirm that we, we do currently have quorum. I have received regrets from Matthew Elliott at this time, so hopefully we should get a couple more members joining us shortly here as well. All right, so um, as it is 6.01, we do have the live stream on and we have quorum, so I'm going to go ahead and, and get us started. So uh, I will need a nomination for the position of chair, please. If anyone wishes to do so. I see Councillor Neal's hand. I will nominate Roger Healy, who has his hands up probably to nominate somebody else, <laughs> but I would nominate Roger. Okay, before I go to Rod, is there um, anyone who wishes to second that nomination? I see that uh, Mr. Dakin has raised his hand. All right, are there any other nominations for the position of chair? Mr. Healy? Yes, uh, um, I thank, thank the people who nominated me and seconded me, but uh, I've been, a, I've been on, on this committee for a while and, and I, I'm hoping to uh, recommend someone I'd like to nominate David Sox to take over as chair, if that's okay. Okay. Is there a second hand for, I see that Councilor Neal is seconding. So, uh, sorry, um, Mr. Healy, I'm just going to confirm that you do not wish to be nominated at this time and you wish to nominate Mr. Sox. Okay, so yeah, I'll have... Uh, Councillor Neal, I'll have you as a seconder. Are there any other nominations for the position of chair? Seeing none, I will call the vote. All those in favor for David Stocks as chair? Any opposed? And that carries, excellent. Um, moving on, we will need a vice chair. Are there any nominations for vice chair at this time? And I see Mr. Healy has his hand raised. Um, yeah, I, I again, I, I haven't had a chance to ask, uh, but Rachel Askett would would uh, I'd like to see her as vice chair. Excellent. So, um, Rachel, <laughs> Ms. Askett, do you do you have any? Um, Objections to being vice chair? No. Okay, excellent. And is there a seconder for this nomination? I see Mr. Stocks, excellent, thank you. And are there any other nominations for the position of vice chair? Seeing none, I will close the nominations and call the vote. All those in favor for Ms. Askett as vice chair, please raise your hand. Are there any opposed? And that carries, excellent. All right, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Stocks to get us started. And uh, just a reminder, Mr. Chair, um, we do have an addendum for this evening if you um, could include that during the approval of the agenda. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing, so everybody can help me here, that'd be great, um, but thank you. Um, so I guess the first thing on the agenda is for me to pull up the agenda. <clears throat> I guess, do I have to call the meeting? No, Elizabeth has called the meeting to order. I'll ask for an approval of the agenda with the addendum at 6.A, a delegation speaking. Councillor Doherty, Rachel seconded. All those in favor? I don't get to vote. Never mind. Um, 
Confirmation of the minutes is next up. Um, this is our from our November the 9th meeting. Should have everybody should have received that. Are there any questions or additions to that November meeting? Seeing none, I'll ask somebody to move that we accept those November meeting agenda or minutes. Roger. I'll move. Se seconder, Councillor Doherty. All those in favor? Okay. Um, disclosure of pecuniary interest. Um, Elizabeth, I, we did get one uh, expression of pecuniary interest, I believe. Roger forwarded that, but do we have to do that at a next meeting? The the member that put it through is not here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, uh, there only needs to be a declaration of interest when the member is present and um, active in the uh, meeting. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Any other pecuniary interest? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to the delegations. So I understand that we've got Jeremy Milloy from River First YGK here to speak to us. Just as a reminder, again, um, Elizabeth, the delegation has five minutes. That is correct, Mr. Chair, five minutes to speak and then the committee can ask questions. Okay, thank you for clarifying. So Mr. Malloy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. That's great. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much to the chair. Thanks uh, to this committee for uh, hearing our delegation. My name is Jeremy Malloy. I'm a coordinating member with River First YGK. River First YGK is a relatively new community group, uh, but we are quite large and active. Uh, we formed in response to the proposal uh, that council heard on April 6th that uh, staff and Transport Canada work together on a possible remediation of the inner harbor of the Kairaki River, um, which um, activated concern and care from a broad segment of the community, uh, reflecting the many different uses and many stakeholders uh, in the Inner Harbor. Um, and since then, uh, we have been working hard to gather more information about, about remediation projects, remediation options, about the ecosystem, about what might be involved, and, and have met with uh, a lot of people. Uh, and there were certainly a lot of unanswered questions at the time of that April 6th meeting. Our group kind of sees our role at this point as not as taking a strong position for or against any remediation option, simply to uh, put, as our name states, the interests of the river first and ensure that uh, the river's health is protected and prioritized for the long term in any remediation that is pursued or not pursued uh, by Transport Canada in partnership with the city. Uh, so we've been trying to find, uh, you know, a lot of different information. Uh, Dr. Lang, who was here tonight, was uh, kind enough to meet with us, and we've been speaking with her and Dr. Reimer, uh, and I was very grateful for her informative uh, presentation and Q&A with Council uh, in their last meeting. Um, and I think um, people who are around uh, this virtual table tonight are already aware that uh, a possible remediation of a historically uh, toxified site like the Inner Harbor is an extremely important and complex issue. Uh, and right now uh, we have many unanswered questions. So um, I just like to share some of our group's questions that come out of you know, uh, the conversations that we've been having, the research that we've been doing, um, and, and, and hopefully they will be helpful to you uh, as you uh, deliberate on this really crucial issue. So um, the first uh, big area of unanswered questions that we have, of course, is uh, what precisely Transport Canada um, is going to propose in terms of a remediation of the Inner Harbor. Uh, where, I, I could give you the journalistic five W's here, where, what exactly, when, um, you know, what part of the ecosystem. 
Uh, and certainly, um, you know, we know that they have, have spent money and been active in the ecosystem, uh, gathering more data since Dr. Lang and Dr. Reimer in the ESG report in 2014. Um, so we are definitely very interested and curious as to what data are in those post-2014 reports, what particular data they are finding most actionable, what they're basing their decision on, and of course, what that decision is uh, in terms of um, in terms of you know, what they plan to do. And although that we don't have that information yet and won't be getting some for uh, some time from Transport Canada itself as the proponent, uh, we still do have a suggestion of, of how we might proceed to make sure that the proposal is as informed and as um, well um, um, studied and um, has the best possible procedure. Uh, number two, in, in a lot of our research that we have done, uh, whether talking to Dr. Lang and Dr. Reimer, talking to experts uh, who have worked on these projects in other ecosystems and other municipalities, uh, two things have become really clear. Uh, number one, that it is uh, important in river remediation projects around the world that there be an organized, effective local group of community members who love and care for the river, uh, considering uh, you know, Hudson River Waterkeeper in upstate New York. Uh, the genesis of the global waterkeeper movement or Friends of the Don River in Toronto, uh, we are certainly hoping to play that role. The second uh, is uh, that source control is, is absolutely crucial in a successful remediation project. So in this case, that means that when a remediation is done, that there not be further contamination happening in the ecosystem from unaddressed source contaminants. So we have uh, definitely questions and concerns about other um, developments happening in the inner harbor simultaneously that might affect this remediation. Specifically, uh, the storm sewer work being done uh, in the area, um, how that might affect and be coordinated so that it is not continuing to produce you know, occasional overflows of contaminants that might undercut the effectiveness of a remediation. Number two, the uh, ongoing proposal on remediating the brownfields at the Tannery Land site and uh, the Patrick Development proposal to remediate those brownfields, which are currently uh, leaching to some extent um, um, toxins into the Inner Harbor. And, and also just, uh, uh, we would like to have greater knowledge as a community about what other sources, uh, you know, industrial, municipal, et cetera, might be um, possibly um, leaching into the harbor uh, that, that might pose a problem down the line. Secondly, uh, so I, I'm gonna wrap up. Um, we basically have two major suggestions to bring before Keith um, this evening. First, uh, because it is essential that uh, there is a full consultation of such a project, um, in these kinds of projects, uh, they, they fall under an environmental assessment procedure. And we have, you know, through our uh, um, research and study have noticed that, you know, Canada does have a federal impact assessment act under which major projects that propose a possible environmental risk or major impact are automatically assessed. So this is a third party federal um, procedure that uh, looks at things uh, that are suggested by all branches of government. Sometimes a project automatically trips that process, but that does not appear to be the case here. Um, we think it might be possible that Transport Canada, the proponent, would be doing what is called a Section 82 evaluation, which basically just only asks the proponent to kind of check its own work and decide whether um, you know, it's proceeding safely. Um, because this is a, um, there are so many different variables at stake here, uh, you know, the, the historic uh, and ongoing cultural importance of Belle Island to the indigenous community of the area, uh, you know, the wildlife, uh, you know, endangered wildlife like turtles and other wildlife like, you know, muskrats, beavers and fish that use the area. The fact yeah. that it, you know, yes. Sorry, can you get to your, you're sort of over your time here. Get, can you get to your second point? My apologies. So I have uh, two suggestions. First, that Keith recommend that uh, council um, request formally from Transport Canada that the proposed remediation of the Inner Harbor undergo a full third party environmental assessment under the Impact Assessment Act. My second, um, based on my earlier comments, is that Keefe suggests that Council ask staff to create a, a report investigating 
uh, these other possible source control contaminants from the Patrick development, the storm sewer, and other local pollutants, and uh, prepare a report on how that might impact any potential remediation and, and present that back to Council. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry for going a little bit over time. No, I, I really appreciate it. I think you've brought some excellent points to us and we appreciate your time and effort that you put into this and the work that your group's doing. So, so thank you. Um, so I guess we're moving on to our briefing, which will pull up Ms. Lang. <laughs> Sorry, uh, sorry, yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, any questions from the members? Uh, Roger, did you have a question first or are you, you just wanting me to slow down here? I'll let, well, I'll let Jim go first. I might have a question here. Okay, thank you. Councillor Neal. Thank you. Um, yeah, with, uh, with delegations, uh, the delegation doesn't have an immediate opportunity to speak to uh, to our staff or to the proponent uh, in future, but I would appreciate uh, hearing from Paul and maybe either of the good doctors uh, addressing some of those uh, good questions that you asked, Jeremy. And I just want to say that was an excellent presentation which isn't a question, but <laughs> thank you. So do either of the um, good doctors have anything or Paul, do you want to comment? Yeah. I can chime in just uh, very briefly. Um, and thank you for the, uh, the delegation. That was excellent. Um, with respect to uh, the level of environmental imp or sorry impact assessment that's that the federal project is undergoing uh, we haven't been provided with that specific information but we are aware that they are undertaking what they call a detailed impact assessment so there is a level of assessment that includes environmental social and uh, economic um, and cultural impacts uh, associated with the project that's happening um, we expect to have additional information come forward from the federal government once we get to the Environment Infrastructure Transportation Policies Committee. And with respect to uh, source control, that uh, that's a logical and, and important step in uh, in any remediation. And we expect to have those conversations with uh, the federal government for their project. And we expect those to include the terrestrial side. So. Uh, adjacent brownfield properties, um, closed landfill, as well as uh, storm sewer outfalls. So we expect to have those conversations uh, and, and assess those from a technical perspective to make sure that there is no risk of recontamination if a, if a remediation takes place. Yeah, perhaps I'll just add here, and I want to thank Jeremy for his presentation and suggestions. Uh, those are very reasonable, and we um, are supportive of that, um, and also uh, Paul's answer. Okay, that's great. Um, Councillor Neal, does that um, suffice? Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, I've got Mr. Healy first, then um, Nathan, then, then Mike. Uh, thanks. Um, I, just a question for uh, Mr. Malloy uh, on the role of Parks Canada in all of this. Uh, um, as a federal, um, federal department or reporting to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, uh, uh, I, I guess I'm just uh, curious uh, as you know, with, with the Rideau waterway being a UNESCO site, what is their role and why, why are we only hearing from Transport Canada here? Uh, Roger, I, I mean, I would say that that's an excellent question. We don't know. That's some of the things that we were trying to ascertain as a group. Um, you know, we have 
various subgroups and one of them is very much just focused on trying to uh, untangle the process here. It is my understanding that probably one of the reasons that parks is involved is because of, as you say, uh, the UNESCO delegate uh, um, uh, thing. Uh, I believe they were also part of uh, some of the work on the third crossing, although staff and counselors would probably know that better than I. Uh, so my, my answer is sorry, I, I wish I knew. Uh, and those are questions our group is asking, but certainly um, uh, it does seem like that Transport Canada is, is the lead proponent here. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Nathan, Mr. Splinter. Thanks. I was just wondering if um, we'll be receiving um, sort of like a written um, submission from, from Jeremy on this topic uh, so that we can review it after the fact. Um, there's a lot to digest in one quick setting. So that's hey. just a quick question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd be happy to uh, to to send a, a written version of, of what we presented this evening, uh, so that you can have some time to reflect it, and then and of course contact us if you have any follow up questions. Um, would the best person uh, be Ms. Fawcett to send that to to circulate to the committee, or should I send it to somebody else? Yeah, okay, I'll send that to you, Mr. Chair. That sounds great. I can send that to the committee as well. That would be great. Thank you. I had the same question, Jeremy, so that's great. Um, Mr. Dakin? Yeah, thanks through you, Mr. Chair. Um, and a question for, for Mr. Malloy. As I understand it, uh, Keith's involvement primarily here is to make a recommendation or um, provide advice as it relates to the city partnering with, with Transport Canada and the other federal agencies. So, so in that light, do I understand it correctly that um, the recommendations you've put forth, uh, first of all, that there be third party review, and then secondly, that there be an investigation of source control. Those are proposed as conditions, I guess, would you say, to, to the city's partnership? Um, recognizing if the city doesn't partner, um, that there's not much of a role, as I believe that, as I understand it, that uh, the city would have it in, in requiring or requesting those items. Sure. Um... I mean, I don't want to swim out further than my depth if you'll permit an aquatic metaphor. Um, I don't think I don't think I would presume to tell the city the conditions upon which they would partner with the federal government on a mediation project. Um, I feel like that's 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 not our decision. I think um, so. I wouldn't term it as conditions. Uh, I just think that those are are good steps uh, to take. Um, I think it would be a very good idea, and and I can't honestly see a downside given uh, the, the, the multiple interests here, um, you know, I mentioned a few of them before. I didn't also mention issues like Metalcraft Marine or, or the property impact on the water lots um, as also um, in play here. I can't think of, a, of any reason that anybody who is concerned about this issue would not want a, a full and robust assessment under the Impact Assessment Act to allow for the maximum of, of explanation, the maximum of community trust, the maximum of community input, and, and, and the knowledge that various stakeholders in our area who have been working on these issues for a very long time could bring to this proposal. So um, I, I don't think it's a condition. I just I would just say that I, it seems like a reasonable step for the city to propose. Uh, and secondly, in terms of, 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 of you know source control and asking staff to prepare that, um, again, I wouldn't see that as a condition, but I do think that that is something that, that the public would like to know. And, and I do think it's something the council uh, would, would like to probably be interested in knowing too, um, because I know that the source control aspect is absolutely critical. And, and because you know issues like these developments are happening simultaneously, I think it's very important to kind of develop some clarity around how that might work. So yeah, while I don't, I would not presume for us to say either that there are conditions or not conditions, uh, they just seem to us like very sensible steps to um, uh, shed more light and, and gain more clarity and, and information and trust on, on what is a very crucial and complex issue. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify that. I'll just say something before Councillor um, Doherty asks her question. I think we'll also get more information, Mr. Dakin, on that um, and Keith's role and the, the process that we're being asked to participate in and how that, um, how these really good questions will be brought to Council and, and or to Transport Canada and in the, con the cons conciliatory way, um, the consultations that Transport Canada is going to come um, and bring to us and that we can be involved with. And so Mr. McClatchy will probably speak more to that once we get to the, that section. Um, unless you want to add something now, Mr. McClatchy. Uh, 
not really, but I mean, I agree. Yes, uh, that is something uh, that I will speak to uh, when the business comes up on the agenda. Okay, that's great. Uh, Councillor Doherty. Um, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, and thanks for your presentation, Jeremy. I had a similar question and, um, and, and I could, I was kind of tempted when you were just saying that it'll come up later to hold on to later, but I'm afraid that I might lose it, but so I'm gonna ask it now. Uh, the suggestions from Jeremy was that council makes two formal requests. Um, is if, so if we don't make those kind of formal requests now uh, through a motion or something like that, or most likely through a motion, um, could it be that the process runs away on us and that we actually miss the opportunity to, to get a third party assessment? Is, is there a likelihood of that? Um, so it is, it, it cer that certainly is possible and, and it just seems to us wise. And again, yeah, our, to clarify, our, our suggestions were to, to request that Keith consider, um, you know, recommending those steps to council. Uh, you know, I'm certainly aware that that, I, that I'm addressing Keith uh, rather than council, but um, it makes the most it makes the most sense, I think, to build those in up front to give everybody the maximum amount of time to gather the information that needs to be gathered because these are some of them are fairly complex questions uh, and, and things need to be set in place and and you know a relationship like you know proceeding with this probably should be set up as easily as possible. Certainly, there are precedents in Ontario recently. Uh, where you know uh, outside groups like you know citizens groups etc have have requested a federal uh, environmental impact assessment act uh, to come in um, far further down the process the mo the most uh, the one that probably a lot of people know about would be the pro the uh, the province of Ontario recommended um, compromising some of the green belt to build a highway uh, in the GTA um, which led to uh, you know the resignation of, of, of some people in charge of uh, supervising the green belt and then a, a request to the federal government to override the province's use of the MZO and to um, actually hold a, a federal impact assessment uh, and now that's a very different type of process uh, in my in, in my and I'm not speaking as a member of river first year I'm that process uh, as somebody who's uh, you know a professional environmental advocate uh, reviewing it, was an attempt by a citizens group to intervene in a in a provincial project they saw as being hostile to the environment. That's not what we're dealing with here, right? We are dealing with, uh, I think, a bunch of people of good faith trying to come together to figure out the best way to remediate historical toxicity in a crucial ecosystem for our watershed community. Um, so that's what, why I was saying up front, like, uh, I do think it should be should be requested at the start because it does allow for the maximum amount of consultation and the best possible relationship for what will be, uh, you know, a multi year long complex process that that will involve a lot of balls being juggled and relationships being connected. Um, and, and I don't see any reason why uh, that, you know, starting with that wouldn't be something that would be welcomed by, uh, by everybody around the table personally. But that's, that's my personal <laughs> opinion. Certainly, I am not, uh, you know, privy to what Transport Canada would think. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Um, any other questions? Seeing none. Um, I guess uh, we just move on to our briefing. So I'll invite um, Dr. Lang, Dr. Reimer to take the floor. I guess that means I need to unmute myself. <laughs> I that. Um, can I just ask how much time we have for the presentation before we, we begin? Elizabeth? Uh, Mr. Chair, through you, um, prior to uh, tonight's um, meeting, there was a conversation with the outgoing chair of Keefe to allow more time to the presenters um, to present the materials, considering that it is a more complex um, matter. Uh, and it was my understanding that they were to be given 20 minutes in order to, um, to do that. It is within your discretion how much time the presenters are given. Is, are, are you, do you have any concerns with the 20 minute timeline? I, I do not. Um, Dr. Uh, Lang, do you have, do you think 20 minutes will be sufficient? 
I do. Um, we're pro we're running it more than ten, but uh, I think twenty minutes should be sufficient. Do you agree, yeah. Ken? I do. Yeah. Dr. Reimer, you agree? I do. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I think that's. I think the committee wants to get the full report, and and we appreciate your time. So, I would agree with that. So now you have the floor. Okay. Great. Uh, well, I would just like to thank um, Keith for the opportunity to give a briefing today. And this briefing is actually very similar to the briefing that we gave last week to council. Um, so I know that some people will be seeing this for a second time, but uh, just to, to go over the presentation summarizes the results from a decade of study that we undertook on the Kingston Inner Harbor, which resulted in a large report, which was finalized in 2014. And that report is now publicly available. Um, I would like to clarify before we start that we're not speaking on behalf of the federal property owners for the Kingston Inner Harbor um, and that the proposed sediment management plan that came to council on April 6 uh, is based on the recent studies and not our 2014 report. However, it does appear uh, that the federal property owners and their consultants have come to very similar conclusions that we did about the Kingston Inner Harbor. And so we're here today to provide context on the studies that were carried out on the KIH prior to 2014, and to respond to questions based on our professional expertise and knowledge of the Kingston Inner Harbor sediment contamination. Uh, next slide, please. So before we get started, just a little bit about our credentials. Um, my name is Dr. Tamsin Lang. I am based with the Environmental Sciences Group at RMC. I have led projects on aquatic contaminated sites across Canada, looking at uh, what contaminants are there, what effects they're having on the ecosystem, and whether there's a need to um, support management actions. I'm a biologist by training with expertise in sediment management, environmental, and ecological risk assessment, I've been working with sediments for approximately 30 years, and I'm one of the lead authors on the 2014 ESG uh, report on the Kingston Inner Harbor. Over to you, Ken. <laughs> Okay, and I'm Ken Ryan. I'm the professor. I'm professor emeritus from RMC. I'm also the founding director of the Environmental Sciences Group. In that capacity, I led hundreds of different types of environmental projects across Canada, both large and small, and I coordinated the 10-year Kingston Inner Harbor project. One of the biggest projects we were involved in was the scientific authority for the Dewline cleanup, which was the cleanup of Cold War radar sites in the Arctic. This was the first major Arctic cleanup, and our group developed the cleanup standards and also did confirmatory, confirmatory testing on behalf of the federal government and the Inuit. More recently in my semi-retired capacity, I chaired the independent expert advisory committee from the Muskrat Falls hydroelectric project in Labrador, where there were tremendous concerns about indigenous people and the public about contamination of country foods due to methyl mercury formed by that particular uh, project. Back to you, Dan. Next slide, please. And so when we think about the Kingston Inner Harbor, there are a number of historical sources of contaminants from in industries that were along the Western shoreline. So this is an aerial view of the harbor here. And to orient you, you can see the line across the harbor at the bottom of the picture, that's the LaSalle Causeway. Bell Island is in the center of the picture. And down the Western shoreline, we see a number of sources that Kingston residents will be familiar with, such as the Davis Tannery, the Bell Park Landfill, uh, Frontenac Smelting Works, which is a lead smelter, uh, the light industries, fuel depot, and coal gasification plant at the approximately location of the Leon Center. And because of these industries, uh, there is a mixture of contaminants that are in the sediments. Studies have shown that water quality is generally uh, pretty good, but the sediments do contain a number of contaminants. Next slide, please. I'm going to show a series of maps of the contaminants, uh, some of the main contaminants in the harbor and their concentrations. Um, just to orient you on this map, the line down at the bottom of the map is a, the LaSalle Causeway. Uh, Bell Island is up near the top of the map. And the colors on the map represent the, the concentrations of the contaminant that we're looking at, uh, with zinc being the one here. So as you move into the yellows, the oranges, and the reds, it's the areas of higher concentration where the concentrations exceed what's called the probable effect level, which is a sediment quality guideline that is associated with effects to aquatic ecosystems. Next slide, please. Uh, 
so sorry, I meant to mention on the last one, uh, sorry, if you can go back for a sec. Uh, zinc, uh, one of the contaminants, you can see higher areas, for example, up here around the Bell Park and Davis Tannery and along Douglas Fir Park in England Bay. Next slide. Uh, arsenic, quite a different pattern, uh, high concentrations in the sediments around the rowing club and the woolen mill. Next slide, please. Mercury, um, it, similarly high concentrations around the rowing club and the woolen mill, but also along Douglas Fleur Park in the sediments. Uh, next slide, please. Lead, as you would expect, given that there is a lead smelter here, it's quite widespread across the harbor. Uh, with the highest locations up near the Davis Tannery um, where the lead smelter was located, uh, but also fairly high along um, Douglas Fleur Park and Anglin Bay. Next slide, please. Uh, PCBs, it's an organic contaminant that can biomagnify in the aquatic food web to high concentrations. Um, and there were the highest concentrations in the harbor sediments are found along the shoreline of Bell Park. Next slide. Uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are combustion products. Um, this example, coal tar, uh, highest concentrations in Anglin Bay and also up along uh, the Bell Park landfill and Davis Tannery. Next slide, please. And finally, chromium, which is the uh, most elevated and widespread contaminant uh, that would have come from the, the former Davis Tannery. Um, with the highest locations up around uh, the Bell Park and um, the Davis Tannery. So uh, complex mixture of sediment contaminants, mostly along uh, with the highest concentrations along the Western shore where the industries were and up around Bell Park and the Eastern part of the Harbor and Northern part of the Harbor are um, relatively clean. Next slide, please. Um, there's a perception among some that these contaminants are tied up in a paste at the bottom of the, the water and they are not moving around. But our study showed that there are a number of processes that can stir up the sediments into the water column. Um, Kingston Inner Harbor is very shallow. It's only about a meter deep uh, throughout. And so that means that um, sources such as boat propellers, um, strong wind uh, storms that sort of create waves, uh, ice, and um, feeding activities of fish like carp, which are quite um, disruptive in their feeding, can all resuspend the sediments, which in that way can be moved around the harbor. Um, we also did sediment coring studies as part of our uh, work. And those studies show that there is very slow burial um, with uh, sediments in some areas of the harbor. Uh, and there are 30 years of studies that show that contaminants in the sediments are taken up into the aquatic food web of the harbor. So the areas of high concentration, you find um, fish and uh, animals living in the sediments have much higher concentrations in their bodies than uh, fish and invertebrates living in other areas of the harbor. Next slide, please. Um, and once they get into the food web, then they can create some ecological uh, risks. And so this is an example of fish that we caught uh, south of Bell Park. These are fish called brown bullhead. And they um, are fish that live closely associated with the sediment. Uh, so they actually bury themselves in the sediment for part of the, the year. Um, and the fish that we caught south of Bell Park had a much higher frequency of external lesions and tumors than fish that were caught in the northern part of the Kingston Inner Harbor. So up in the upper right, for example, you can see an example of an epidemal uh, ulcer on a brown bullhead. And brown bullhead are commonly used in other uh, areas of the Great Lakes contaminated site as indicators of ecological effects. Next uh, slide, please. Um, but there are risks actually throughout uh, the ecosystem as well as some human health risks um, related to the sediment contamination. So our study took place over a decade. We had over a thousand sediment sample analyses, um, hundreds of uh, studies, uh, samples of tissue from uh, over 15 species um, and dozens of sediment toxicity tests. And the, some of the, the main findings that we found were that uh, in the areas of highest concentration, the sediments show some toxicity to animals living within the sediments. So that's an example up in the upper left um, the uh, 
worms and the aquatic larvae that are eaten as prey by fish. When you expose these um, animals to uh, sediments from the most contaminated areas, then uh, they die or they, the growth and reproduction are um, affected. We talked a little bit about effects on fish, um, but there are also risks to wildlife through eating contaminated food items for the, from the most uh, heavily um, contaminated areas of the harbor. And so uh, the aquatic larvae and the fish are important prey for a lot of um, birds and mammals. And using established frameworks from Environment Canada, we did um, see risk to uh, upper level um, consumers like birds and mammals. For human health risks, uh, the areas of highest concentration uh, show unacceptable risks um, by skin contact. This would be for repeated exposure. So occasional uh, exposure to the sediments is probably not a great concern, especially if you wash your hands. But if uh, you're coming into contact with the sediments frequently, uh, for example, by swimming or wading or other activities, uh, then that poses um, unacceptable risks in some areas of the harbor. And lastly, uh, people that fish from the harbor should be aware that there are currently fish consumption advisories in place for the Kingston Inner Harbor. Um, those are due to con the contaminant concentrations such as mercury, PCBs, and chromium in some species of fish. Um, they can be found on the Ontario Guide to Eating Fish and they are species specific and they, they limit the number of meals that are safe to eat per month because of these contaminant concentrations. Next uh, slide. Um, so it's important to know that um, the risks are not spread uh, across the harbor generally, uh, but the contaminated sediments along the western shoreline and south of the Bell Park uh, would be the areas that show the, the greatest risk because this is where we find the greatest concentrations of contaminants. Next slide. Um, one method for, for dealing with uh, contamination at aquatic contaminated sites can be monitored natural recovery where you allow clean sediments to bury um, the, the uh, contaminated ones and recover over time. And we did look at this as, as part of our study. Um, from the information provided in the April 6th City Council backgrounder, this has been proposed for most of the harbour area. But our study did find that it wouldn't be effective in areas along the western shoreline where the contaminant concentrations are high. And we know from sediment coring studies that burial with clean sediments occurs very, very slowly. So even though the industries have not been discharging pollution um, for decades, there are still very high concentrations of contaminants in the surface sediments. And so people should know that if this remediation does not take place, the high concentration of contaminants in the sediments near the western shoreline and the area south of Bell Park will remain. And they are a, a main source of human health and ecological risk. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Reimer. Okay, next slide, please. Sorry, next slide. Thank you. So if the, if the river can't heal itself, what techniques can be used? Well, in some cases, you can add a material to cap the contamination, so you force the burial of the material. But dredging is a standard remediation technique used at many sites uh, around the world. Uh, and it's used to uh, remove that sediment and just take it to a different location and uh, treat it or deal with it as a, a contaminated material. Now, you might suspect that if you dredge, you could cause a lot of resuspension or mixing of that sediment up into the water above. Um, section dredges can limit that. They're like giant vacuum cleaners that suck up this material. But if in fact you get that resuspension and you will get some, you can have engineered controls to minimize that movement of that contaminated sediment from the area you're working in to another area. So in the picture in the middle of this slide, you can see resuspended material on the right, cloudy water and clearer water on the left on the other side of the control measure. So this is one of the ways in which they can minimize the export of contamination from outside that particular work area. If there is a fugitive emission from that work area, there is, always in, uh, strict environmental quality measures put in place. So water quality monitoring on a constant basis to assess uh, whether something is going amiss and then to shut down the, pro the work at that time and to fix that problem. One of the important things to note about this particular project is that the contaminants are bound to the sediment particles. So if you think of that bottom left-hand picture, the brown objects are sediment particles to which contaminants are attached. The, 
biological life can suck those contaminants off and take it into their bodies, but they don't dissolve easily into water. So the water that's trapped between those sediment particles in the sediments don't contain high concentrations of those contaminants. So when you do remove that, that sediment material, you don't have dissolved material going into the river, which would be a problem because that you can't contain with a physical barrier. So there are ways to do this. Next slide, please. So sediment remediation in the Kingston area can be done safely without catastrophic impacts if in fact these controls are put in place. Next slide, please. So how do we know that? Well, we know that from a number of very successful projects uh, around North America and around the world. One of the first and really large projects was the Hudson River uh, project in Northern New York State. Uh, historically, um, and not surprisingly historically, General Electric dumped transformer fluid like many uh, rivers, they were the recipients of waste containing PCBs. And when this was discovered and the fact that this was having a significant impact on biological life in the river and the, the ability for people to use the river properly, um, and this was in the 1980s, it, it was recognized there was no technology that we could safely deal with those sediments at that time. But over the next 20 years, the Environmental Protection Agency realized that there were measures that had the technology advanced and they could move forward. And they did uh, embark on remediation, mainly dredging, supported by capping, and some monitored natural recovery where it was appropriate. And it was done in two phases. Very carefully, they did a phase one to see how that worked, uh, what the problems were, and then how they could apply those lessons learned to phase two, which was successful. And then over a period of six years, an enormous amount of contaminated material was removed from the river uh, over a 40 mile section. Next slide, please. I mentioned that project because I was personally involved in it. I was a chair of two independent peer review committees for the Hudson River project. And these peer review committees are truly independent of both uh, the General Electric, who was gonna to have to pay for the work and the Environmental Protection Agency. The first was to deal with questions that, well, is the remediation necessary? And we've heard many of the same questions being asked by the community today. The river looked healthy, but you can't see the effects of chemical contamination in many cases. Uh, and that's a, a, an issue. So that committee decided that yes, there was sufficient evidence to indicate that the river would not heal itself and it was having a serious impact and the project needed to go forward. Later on, I chaired a second committee, which was to develop the performance standards, those things like the control measures, the water quality monitoring and so on, to ensure that the project did what it was supposed to do, that it was to clean up the river, but not to have greater impacts downstream. I didn't chair it, but there was also a quality of life standards committee that looked at all kinds of other impacts, whether the project would be creating too much noise. Uh, they intended working long hours. Would lights bother be bothering people along the shoreline? And also the economic issues that needed to be dealt with because of people that were making their living from areas around the shoreline of the river. Other projects exist, many other projects exist. Uh, I'm, I was not part of this one, but Rock Bay in Victoria, BC is not a dissimilar project in some ways, located in the downtown core and with traditional First Nations territories. Some of the most contaminated sediments of Victoria Harbor were located in this particular area. And one of the factors that people took into account during the actual dredging work was to relocate wildlife to a more a safer area prior to the dredging operation itself. Next slide, please. So we welcome the community concerns that have been raised. Uh, I think I can say that both our halves, Tam. Uh, we really think that it's important that the community talk about this project and express their concerns. It's important to know though that, and I take uh, the points made earlier, sediment management projects have to have a detailed impact assessment and we applaud the fact that there should be one. Uh, they need to be asking the questions that are necessary. How do they minimize negative social and economic impacts? How can you plan activities to avoid impacts to wildlife? And how can you ensure that the remediation work is successful? That means it does more good than harm. And keeping in mind that there are many examples of this being successfully carried out. Next slide, please. So we do believe that this can be done safely. And if done and done appropriately, uh, it will result in a healthier river ecosystem and decreased human health risks. And uh, if I can think back to when I was chair of Keefe and actually hosted a, a visioning exercise um, almost 20 years ago for the Kingston Inner Harbor, 
we heard from people in the community that they want to use the river extensively. And we think that people could, uh, wildlife could enjoy the river more, people could enjoy it more. Kayaking, canoeing, rowing, uh, swimming would be something that would be appropriate in a remediated river environment. So I think this is an opportunity to um, overcome decades of contamination and move it in the right direction, but it has to be done properly. Next slide. With that, um, that concludes our briefing and uh, there is more information in our addendum to the May 18th council meeting. And as Tam mentioned at the outset of this presentation, the, uh, our 2014 report is available, it's publicly available. Thank you. Uh, I was just saying thank you, Dr. Reimer and, and Dr. Lang. That was very informative. Um, I'm sure we've got questions from the Keep members. Um, I've got Doc Councillor Neal and Councillor Doherty. Thank you very much for your presentation. I see it three or four more times. I'll, I'll note off by heart. <laughs> which is a good thing. <laughs> I, uh, real, it's, it's a very thorough report and I'm gonna ask you some of the same questions I asked at council because I have lots of friends that live along the Inner Harbor and the questions that I've received via email or telephone are um, the timeline, when, when do you think it would be safe for swimming? and safe for fishing along the inner harbor. And will, I presume being on uh, uh, KFLNA public health, that that will be tested on a regular basis. Is, could you uh, address that please? Pam, do you wanna take it or me? Uh, why don't I start and then you can uh, <laughs> follow sure. up if we'll I have this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I'd like to start off by saying that that these questions really need to be asked to Transport Canada and Parks Canada to to uh, to explain the details of their their plan and their goals. But uh, that um, in general, um, swim swimming um, would be safe relatively soon after if uh, the river is dredged to the standard where it would be safe to swim, uh, because the little suspended sediment in the, the column that was uh, in the water column. Fishing um, takes longer because fish live a long time and they, the older fish will have um, higher levels of contaminants for some time. The younger fish as they're born will be exposed to less. And it's worth noting too with, with this remediation that um, that sometimes you can't get to the point where all fish are, are safe to eat um, all the time. The, you can get to the point where you lower the, the consumption advisories. And again, that's a question that would need to be asked for, for Parks Canada and Transport Canada. Great, much appreciated. Go ahead, Ken, did you wanna? I, I think Tam's really covered it. I think that, yeah, swimming would be almost immediate once the project was complete. Um, because there's usually some habitat restoration that takes place after dredging and remediation activities. Uh, that reduces the principal mean of human, means of human contact, which is direct con contact with the con contaminated sediment. And I certainly agree that, uh, I mean, the fish that have contaminants in them will, re will retain those contaminants, uh, unfortunately. But it does mean that going forward, uh, both those fish, and also that means the prey for other animals living in the river ecosystem will be not, you know, they won't be contaminated like they are today. Thank you very much. A follow-up, Councillor Neal or uh, Councillor Doherty. Thanks, Dave. Um, and through you. Um, so I just wonder, thanks for your presentation. It, uh, it you de actually, it's helpful to hear it a few times. Um, what happens to the to the sludge uh, after the dredging? Like, where does it go, and how is it treated? Are we not transporting one problem to another area? I, I'll try to handle that one. 
Uh, that's again a question, of course, that the project proponents will have to address specifically. Um, there are many different fates of that contaminated material. For what the main thing is, it has to go somewhere where it's not in contact with the ecosystem. Um, our study showed, and I will have to see whether transport agrees, but um, I suspect they will, that this material doesn't leach. That means it doesn't uh, leak contaminants out if it's put in a landfill, for example. So it could be used as fill uh, in a landfill, uh, constructively. Uh, it could be used in a number of probable sources of, of as long as it's, because it, because it doesn't, when it comes in contact with water, it doesn't leach out the contaminants. The contaminants are stuck to that material. So it can be used for purposes that are possibly constructive, but certainly it's not going to be in the bottom of the river where things are coming in contact, where they can absorb that contamination into their bodies. That's the key part. How it's dealt with, um, in the Hudson River, much of that material was either treated, some of it was landfilled, some of it was incinerated because PCBs are kind of difficult to deal with in, in various ways. So it'll be a matter for the pro project proponents, in this case, transport and parks to specifically address as to where this material is going to go. Uh, but it is probably one of the, um, I'll, our study suggested it would be one of the more easier materials to handle the material that would be highly leachable, for example, which would be stuff that leaches is called hazardous waste. This is not uh, in that context, once it comes out of the river. Um, so yeah, we have to keep track of the questions that we have to ask Transport Canada, <laughs> they're adding up. Um, another question is the, the dredging, uh, what kind of harm or risk it is, is it as opposed to the existing aquatic life? When you like, um, particularly that picture that you showed was, which is a good one where you, you show the, the clean water on the one side and the stirred up water on the other side with this giant vacuum cleaner coming along, like that must suck some fish and some aquatic life up too and damage that existing wildlife in, uh, life in the, in the water. Well, uh, I can speak, I can start off with that one, Ken. Um, so any dredging project will need to have a plan to deal with the wildlife and the, um, the dredging area is isolated from the, the water body as we saw with, uh, for example, by silt curtains or other engineered controls. And it's typically done sort of in parcels. So you, you start with the, the work area that you have and then before any work starts, you relocate all of the, uh, the wildlife that's within that work area outside the barrier to say to another area uh, of the harbor where the work activities are not taking place. Um, so that's one standard way that's used on a lot of projects. And then you have people monitoring to ensure uh, that you've, you've been successful. And I think as Ken mentioned um, on Rock Bay, which was also another Transport Canada project, I believe, um, approximately 3000 fish and other wildlife were relocated out of the dredging work area into the surrounding so they are not there when the dredging is taking place. And that's a key point. And I think the, the way to picture it, I think that's what very, Tam correctly, very correctly illustrated was that it's work parcels. It's not like they go in and start willy nilly dredging the, the whole inner harbor. They have to work in systematically in specific areas and have a plan to deal with each of those areas in turn. Um, just a follow up on that. Um, I, I, I have no knowledge when it comes to all of this, but when it comes to bacteria, there are healthy bacteria and, and obviously not, not healthy bacteria. And I can only imagine that in water, there must be some, some very small micro kind of um, um, microbes that exist in water that are really, really beneficial for and necessary. I, I've had a, a fish tank before. Fish tanks are like that. They need their, their uh, like a really good balance. Like how does this system that you mentioned, you doing it in section, does it also protect the very small microbe kind of healthy like, life that's necessary for a healthy aquatic system? Well, I think again, because you do it in parcels, 
you allow for um, the microbes sort of around it to still be there. And they, they recolonize and recover very quickly uh, given the size. Excellent. I concur, I'd have to defer to my biology colleague. I'm a chemist by training, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, that is good to know. And any follow-ups, Councillor Doherty? Um, my co-chair, Rachel, and then Nathan. Thanks to your presentation today. That was very clear for someone who doesn't have a background in this uh, specialty, so thank you. Um, I noticed like a lot of our questions right now, though, are deferring back to um, assumptions about what we would assume Transport Canada's conclusions have been. Um, we don't have a lot of information on you know, where this project has really originated from as far as the information that they're using. Does anyone on the committee have an idea of like where we're at with communication with Transport Canada and when we might be able to have um, time to speak with them about their proposal and their actual course of action? Could you speak to that, Paul? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. Um, so the original intention of the April 6th report to council that provided that initial information about the proposed federal project was to, to allow council to give us the, well, to allow council to be informed about what was happening, but also to seek council's approval for staff to start discussing um, details of a potential partnership and details of their project uh, with them. Um, since that time, we have um, had numerous discussions um, with the federal government so that we could prepare to respond to council's motion of deferral, which was to defer that, that, uh, rec that staff recommendation until um, a public meeting could be held by the EITP committee. So um, we expect the federal government to bring a lot of information to the EITP committee that will answer, I'm sure, a lot of the questions that are being pitched around right now. Um, and that's good, that's the intention of it for sure. But uh, as I said earlier, right now, we understand that um, the stage that the federal government is, and when I say the federal government, I mean Transport Canada, who owns the majority of the water lots that are subject to this proposal, Parks Canada, who own a small portion of the water lots, and then uh, Public Services and Procurement Canada, who's kind of the, uh, the, uh, the federal agency that does the project on behalf of those two uh, of those two uh, of Transport Canada and Parks Canada. Um, so we've had discussions with them and they're, they've told us that they're at an early stage of their design. They don't have a detailed design or a construction plan or anything like that done yet. Um, they have started a detailed impact assessment and that's the assessment of determining what kind of wildlife and habitat are within the proposed work area, what the so that they can they can accurately assess what the potential impacts of doing the project might be and how then to anticipate those and mitigate them through some of the measure, measures that uh, Tamsin and, and Ken have spoken about, but also the uh, some of the social, cultural and economic impacts that they'll have to be aware of. Um, so presumably that would include things like um, an economic impact to uh, places like uh, Kingston Marina and Metalcraft Marine and how they're going to deal with that. Um, they've also told us um, that they had planned to do a public consultation uh, program for the project. In, so let me back up. They had planned to do Indigenous consultations, stakeholder consultations, and public consultations as part of the project. Their, we understand that their Indigenous consultations and their stakeholder consultations have started. The city being a stakeholder, we, that's why they came to us and asked us to uh, consider partnering so that we could include some small city-owned water lots that are in the, uh, in the more contaminated areas. Uh, <clears throat> um, so the public consultation, they've told us that they wanted to start that in July, but because of the... Um, community interest that was demonstrated on April 6th and then, and then uh, thereafter, they, I think, have taken a step back and are, are 
redesigning and rethinking their public consultation program because I think it needs to be, and obviously I think it is, it does need to be a, um, a more thorough and comprehensive approach to community consultation than perhaps they were anticipating. So that's, that's what we know about the federal project thus far. Um, uh, to be honest, we, we were expecting to get into a lot of these details when we started to discuss the potentials for partnership and so forth. And we hope to, uh, we hope to see a lot more information from the federal government on the project when they come to the Environment, Infrastructure and Transportation Policies Committee. And I will say, um, we just learned uh, the other day that I believe it's September the 28th will be the date for the uh, public meeting held by the Environment, Infrastructure and Transportation Policies Committee. So that's, that's good to have that date firmed up. Thanks, Paul. Follow up, Rachel, or? No, that was great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Nathan? Thank you. Um, through you, I have a question sort of about, um, considering it sounds like the focus of the cleanup will be uh, near shore in water, um, but I mean, thinking back to the, the source of the contamination, it, 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 it was on, on land. And so a lot of that, um, those, those sites are still um, contaminated. The, the onshore sites are still contaminated. And, you know, it, it's my understanding that the majority of this, the contamination that's ended up in the river has gotten there either through perhaps dumping or runoff um, being the two ways. So if we're going to clean up the river before we've cleaned up some of the shoreline sites or, you know, Bell Park and the tannery, et cetera. Um, is there a risk of, you know, having leaching back into the river uh, if those sites aren't also dealt with in a timely manner? Or is there enough um, mitigation already implemented to keep that from happening? Um, yeah, I, so I can speak a little bit to that. We, we did look at um, sources as part of our, our report. And a lot of the major sources, um, such as Bell Park, and there was a, a source around the rowing club um, and other areas, the city has actually put in a lot of remedial measures and um, follow-up confirmatory sampling through the provincial environmental regulators has indicated that, uh, that the, those um, areas are no longer sources and uh, Paul, I should defer to you because you know much more about this than me, but that was our conclusion at the, at the time of the report. Uh, there are still areas um, that do need to be dealt with and one area uh, in particular would be the small wetland north of um, the Davis Tannery and uh, perhaps from that, Paul, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to, to respond further based on your knowledge. Sure, thanks, Tam. Um, so certainly, yeah, Bell Park was probably uh, a contributor to the some of the contamination in the Inner Harbor uh, decades ago. Um, but if you can imagine a sponge full of contaminated stuff, slowly it's kind of drained itself out. And the uh, the stuff that's left in the, in the landfill site itself is of much, much lower strength and is being contained through leachate collection pumps and systems like that that we've put in place. Uh, and I agree with, with Tamsin that the, the wetland, what we call the orchard marsh uh, that sits between the tannery and, the, and Bell Park, that was historically the effluent discharge area for the tannery. Also a lot of tailings and, and, and effluents from the old uh, lead smelting works there. So those, those organic sediments in the, in the, in that, uh, in that marsh are, uh, the most contaminated materials, I believe, in the Inner Harbor. So if the Inner Harbor is cleaned up and the wetland is not, then um, every time we get a big rain, you stand the risk of having some of those highly contaminated sediments flushed out into the Inner Harbor again. So um, as, uh, as Jeremy Malloy um, indicated earlier, source control uh, is very important part of a remediation project and the source that is the orchard marsh has to be examined and we have to we have to examine how we can control that so that it doesn't 
pose a risk to recontaminate the inner harbor after the cleanup happens. I'll just add on top of that, that many of the, the other sources, um, the bulk of the, the contamination is already in the sediments. And so there's a relative portion to this too in that uh, we are in an urban environment. Um, we won't be able to return the harbor to a pristine condition because we have, um, you know, we drive cars and we, ha we, we there are inputs associated with our activities, but relatively, they're relatively small compared to the bulk of the contamination that sits in the sediments at the bottom of the harbor and poses risk to the ecosystem there. I can just elaborate on that. I mean, the point to note is that the, if you see historical photos of the tannery in operation, it's quite astonishing seeing the discharge of material, the intentional discharge of material. So that's why the bulk of the material is actually in the river sediments now, because the river is used as a dumping ground. And so it, uh, it, it got there as a legacy issue. I, I agree with all the comments about the orchard marsh and, and so on but uh, the massive bulk of material occurred due to intentional effluent discharge during the operation of those facilities. Nathan, do you have a follow-up? Okay, that's great. Um, Rachel, another question? Yeah, I just had a follow-up to Nathan's question actually about the source of the contaminants. Um, do we know like, the end destination of the contaminants for sure? Is there a reason why you selected between the causeway and Bell Island or is it possible like with the wetlands being such a source of pollution that those sediments could actually be farther up the river as well and we're not really translating the whole area of the contamination and then you get that resurfacing traveling back down the river again. Maybe yeah, that's actually, let me let me sorry. start Tam, because I used to live whenever I look at that first cover picture of our slide presentation I can see my house. Uh, so I live north of Bell Island on the river. So one of the first places we looked was offshore of my house. <laughs> for obvious reasons. So we did do studies of the sediments all from you know the 401 down to to Bell Island. It wasn't just restricted there. We've done some work in the outer harbor as well south of the causeway. So the answer is that the area that is uh, north of Bell Island is not anywhere near as contaminated. Uh, it is relatively clean. I'll put it in that context for an urban environment. Um, that's because the flow of the river is north to south. And so the contaminants are moving and they're being resuspended uh, with all the uh, mechanisms, wave action, et cetera, that Tam mentioned. And they're moving sort of eastward and southward uh, into the inner harbor from the original sources. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Mr. Healy. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> thanks. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, uh, a question I, during the presentation, it, it flashed by me and I, I don't know if I heard it properly, but um, I think it was you, Dr. Reimer, who was saying that these these materials, so so things, the metallic things like chromium and lead, uh, do they they are they in their elemental form, or or do they they bind with with particles in the in in the substrate so that, uh, for example, they 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 don't dissolve again, or they don't. They don't reappear in the water column when they're disturbed. Can you just uh, refresh my memory if, or go over that section that you I certainly presented? can. Uh, the, uh, they are not elemental. Uh, all of those chemicals will be, when we say of lead, we're talking about the principal element there, but it will be combined with other elements uh, in some form. But it is attached to the sediment particles. Uh, it is stuck to them. Uh, there are many forms of those metals that are water soluble. It happens to be the case that these are the ones that are more attached to uh, the, the sediment particles themselves. So the form of chromium is a form that is relatively insoluble in water and sticks to things like sediment particles. It's not the form of chromium that dissolves in water, for example. So that gives us a huge opportunity because, uh, well, for one thing, the river 
water would be water quality would not be would continue not to be good because you would have leaching of the material from the sediments into the river. Uh, that's not been the case. The water quality is generally good. Uh, in fact, the reason swimming doesn't take place is because of contact with the sediments themselves. So the removal is much easier when you have the contaminants stuck to those sediment particles because now you're talking about the physical removal of those particles, that material that makes up the, the, the bottom of the river. Um, does that answer, I'm sorry, does that answer your question? Okay, I think, so. I, I, yeah, I was, I was just curious about the, the, whether they, uh, they form uh, uh, compounds uh, as a, or, or if they're still in their metallic form uh, and, and if they form compounds, um, how soluble they are. And I think you, you, you address that. So, so you're saying they're not very soluble in general or, or is, this, is this chromium particular? Or, I know chromium is one of the big ones. Uh, lead is a big one and, and uh, arsenic is another one. Are they, do they vary in, in how soluble they are? They do, and they also vary in their ability to uh, adhere to sediment particles. So um, we, we actually looked at the chemical forms of chromium in the river. Uh, the form that's there is chromium-3. It's, it's not very water-soluble. It sticks to the sediments. Chromium-6 is a form that is very water-soluble. Uh, so we know the form because we studied that. We also took uh, samples of that sediment and extracted the pore water. That's the water that gets trapped. You know, sed sediments are formed by soil and other material running off from land and falling to the bottom of the river and eventually building up and accumulating. And of course, it traps water in there. That was that little picture I showed where we had those stylized sediment particles and then the trapped water called pour water. So what you can do is you can assess the ability of the material, the contaminants that are in those sediments themselves uh, to dissolve in the pour water by actually squeezing the water out and then analyzing it. And, and we did that. So okay. we know that it is not, uh, the material is not soluble, it's stuck to those sediment particles. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, I have a, can I carry on with another question, Mr. Chair? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, I have a couple of questions, so, so I, I, won't, I won't monopolize things, but I, um, I, I remember the, when the third crossing, uh, uh, project was un getting underway and, and it's north of Bell Island and there were core samples taken as part of the, the examination of the, of the sediments and looking at his structural feasibility and all that stuff. Uh, were those core samples analyzed uh, by you or by others uh, do, to indicate uh, whether there was a presence of, of some of these uh, toxic met metals? We weren't involved in that particular aspect of the project, but uh, what we did do is take extensive sediment samples throughout the north, the area north of Bell Park. Uh, not in as detailed a grid as you see it, all those little points on the, the maps that uh, Tam showed, but certainly enough to cover the whole area. And there wasn't a history of uh, that type of historical industrial contamination. So first of all, you don't anticipate them to be there, but we looked. And so we are, you know, we were confident that you don't have that type of contamination you have sort of not pristine because you have material that might be you know, finding its way from upstream sources in small amounts over time. But so it's not, you know, it's, it's an urban waterway basically, but they are very, uh, you know, the sediments are really quite clean uh, north of Bell Island, Bell Park area compared to anything to the south. The, the concentrations in those colored maps are a little hard to discern, but they are, in the tens of thousands of parts per million in some cases, that's almost unheard of for, uh, I've done a lot of work on contaminated sites, both in land and in, in water. Uh, even on land, that's, those are big numbers, <laughs> really big numbers. Okay, yeah, sorry, to, just to follow up a bit, the, the core samples that were taken, I guess it would have been around 2017 or 2016, so that was after your study was completed, but um, uh, were, are those samples available, the analyses of those samples available for, for say to Transport Canada or to follow just, just to add to the, uh, the data that we have on, in this area? That might be a question that we put to uh, Transport Canada. 
but I'll, I'll yield to Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know there was a lot of uh, sediment sampling that took place mainly for, I mean, for the third crossing, mainly for geotechnical reasons, but also from the perspective of how do they manage the sediment that has to be moved and so forth during the construction. So they didn't want to get into a situation where they encountered highly contaminated sediment. And to the best of my knowledge, they did not. Um, but I'm sure all of that data is still available in their, uh, in their various technical reports. Follow up, Roger, or are you? Okay. Uh, well, well if, uh, again, I, I don't want to monopolize things. I just have a couple of other quick questions. Um, I thought you had and, two. And actually, uh, sorry? I'm done. I'm done. Let someone else go. <laughs> I said you had two last time. Go ahead, sorry. Um, the the uh, I'm thinking of the uh, recent incident in Flint, Michigan, where um, uh, water uh, basically, uh, as I understand it, it simply a water source was diverted or ch changed, and it was uh, the water in the new source, uh, a, sec a different section of the river, uh, was uh, was more acidic. And, and it, uh, the, the, the more acidic water uh, basically redissolved more lead from, from the pipes uh, that, that everybody had in the city. And it, and it, it introduced a, a whole new source of lead. Um, it, it, I guess my, my question is, how does the pH of the water affect these things and and uh, and uh, do do we know that that uh, the ph of the water uh, uh, won't change once it's disturbed oh i'll start with that ken and then you can jump in but um ph does have a really big effect on what ends up being dissolved in the water but here in kingston we're on limestone and so Generally, when uh, you're on limestone bedrock, the pH is alkaline. And in that circumstance, things tend to precipitate out. And Ken, if you want to add any details there? No, that, that's an extremely good point. I mean, it, uh, there's no question that if I was to take a sample, in fact, one of the ways we analyze for lead in sediments is to extract the lead from the sediments with strong acid. So uh, the, the situation here is actually a, a ideal. We have an alkaline environment. Uh, the situation in Flint, although I vaguely recall that story, remember that the source of the lead though was in the pipes. So you're adding acid to the pipes and then the acid was dissolving the lead from the pipe. Uh, we're not even close to that here and we have the great buffering capacity of a, of a limestone to help us out with this. Okay, okay great. And uh, related to that uh, question I, I asked earlier about the involvement of Parks Canada. Um, the, when, I, when I was, Keith did look at, at issues related to the third crossing uh, uh, back in 2017. And I was, I was doing a little bit of, uh, you know, searching with Dr. Google and, uh, and uncovered a, a story that had just recently appeared at the other end of, of the Rideau Canal in the Ottawa area. And uh, uh, they were, uh, uh, Parks Canada was, was involved in, in uh, re rebuilding or refitting some of the stone, uh, stonework around the Rideau Canal at that end, at the very north end. And um, uh, what, what happened was during the, as they started some of the work, they they noticed it was there, there was some contamination discovered, and so they stopped the work. And uh, the the report the article uh, ended with a I just reread it a very interesting second last paragraph. It said uh, scientists con I'm quoting this, the story here uh, scientists contacted by CBC News say the industrial waste is likely well buried by sediment. And that even if tests uncover toxins, the safest option may be to leave them untouched rather than carry out a cleanup. 
And and I, I just uh, having reread that, I thought, wow, that that's a very striking comment. And and I, I understand it's just a, a reporter's version of what scientists at that point said to them. But um, uh, I, I'm just asking you again: Does that sort of ring any bells, or or or, or are there any comparisons to the Ottawa end of the Rideau Canal versus the Kingston end? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that specific story, but what I could say is that when you have a situation where you have a deeper body of water or relatively quietly moving water uh, and you have sedimentation, that is material, new material coming into the river or lake, ideal little lake or harbor, um, you can get natural attenuation. You can get burial. Um, that's no question. I don't know the circumstances from that story, so I couldn't comment on those. But we do believe also, and I, I think what we saw from the April 6th meeting, it appears so does Transport Canada, that parts of this inner harbor can be subject to natural attenuation, just not the areas to the western shoreline that are most contaminated. So it depends ex entirely on, and going back to the Hudson River example, there are parts of the Hudson River that were actually not touched because they were in areas where it was quieter, deeper, and the contamination was being buried by clean material. But there was also 2.6 million cubic yards of material that couldn't be left in place because it was not being buried. It depends where and the circumstances. Yeah, I agree. Um, going back to the slide that I presented on monitored natural recovery, our, our uh, sediment coring studies showed that that burial with clean sediments is not happening um, fast enough, it's very, very slow in, in the areas of the harbor where uh, there's a lot of contamination. So it can't, you can't use that process to address the sediments in that area. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks, that's, that's all. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Great. Councillor Neal, did you have another question or no? Uh, Umida? I'm sorry. Yeah, you're unmuted. Yeah, I, um, the other projects that were done before in other parts, um, did they replace, did they put any new clean sediment into the, the river um, at, as part of the remediation? Because the sediment is important to retain contaminants and maintain the water clean and animals use, it, especially invertebrates. So mm -hmm. is, is that, yeah. That's a great question. And that again, depends on the project. It's a question to ask Transport Canada and Parks Canada about their plans. Um, some projects do put um, a layer of clean sediment afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, almost as a cap and restore habitat for, as you said, yeah, the like kind of restoration in the. In the um, so that would be a question to ask um, of the more detailed sediment management plan. Uh, it's, it's not plan. uncommon. That's the, yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question. So I believe I need to yield the chair to to Rachel. Do we have to do that formally, or do you? I, uh, I also don't know, <laughs> Elizabeth. Oh. Mr. Chair, through you, it, you can just pass the chair and ask the vice chair to take it, and then the vice chair will just give you the floor, and then you'll need to reverse the process when you're done speaking. Thank you. All right, you have the floor. Thank you. My question is um, with regards to, I'll, I'll call it garbage, not really, but um, old cement culverts and uh, barges and metal things that are in there too. Um, was anything in your study um, done to look at some of those things and whether they'd get removed and, and this is probably a question for Transport Canada, but that's also what we're doing here is developing those questions. So um, maybe could you speak to that, the residual parts of barges and piers and the things that would have been there? 
Sure, we didn't look at that in specifically as part of our study, but uh, I think, as you said, it is a question for Transport Canada and Parks Canada. Uh, you would need to look at that when you're coming up with a detailed engineered design for dredging uh, to know where areas is usually referred to as debris or also where archeological remains are. So um, that should be asked uh, when, they, when they develop their uh, and present their proposed sediment management plan. I concur. I, they, they, they have to address those points. We got to, we didn't do that because we got to the stage in our report of identifying there was an issue, a problem, a problem that wasn't going away and that needed to be dealt with. That then takes us into the next phase. How do you do it? And uh, that wasn't where we went. Um, but those are the questions that need to be addressed. Any follow-up there, Dave? That's good. No, that's great. I'll hand the chair back to you. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. So again, on behalf of the Keith, thank you very much for your time and your presentation. That was amazing. It is the second time that I've seen that too. And it's very informative and, and we really appreciate your time and efforts. So thank you. Well, thank you. I'll take my leave, but I, it was nice being back with Keith again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Elizabeth, did you need to add anything? Um, so we're moving on to- oh, Sorry, Mr. Chair, can I just add it? I was going to ask actually Elizabeth or, or, or you as chair, uh, in, um, is there not an opportunity for any member of the public to ask questions? Yes, I believe there is. And Elizabeth will confirm that, but I believe that comes out of the business section. Oh, okay, thanks. You are correct, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just going to say- uh, Sorry, members I've frozen? No, that's okay. So there are, um, there, we do have members of the public who, who may have some questions and we can address those during the business item. Um, should the presenters still be available and they have questions um, regarding the briefing themselves and the presenters are willing to answer those questions, they can do so during the business item as it relates. that answer that, Councillor Doherty? Sorry, I'm on mute. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Sorry, so I'm just texting Ken to ask him to come back for those questions. <laughs> um, I'm also having some internet connectivity problems, so I might be blanking out here a little bit. Apologize for that. Um, so we're moving on to the business section. So the information on contaminated sediment management plans for the Kingston Inner Harbor. Now, again, Elizabeth, is this just a report that we have read? Um, Paul, do you wanna to speak to that? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, staff can provide a, an introduction to the report and the committee has another opportunity to ask some questions as well as members of the public. And I, and I uh, will provide some introductory remarks. So the staff report that uh, is uh, before Keith tonight uh, is an information report. So there's no recommendation. There's no action that needs to be taken um, from it. The purpose of the report was to provide Keith with a very high level overview of um, the 2014, a high level overview of information available about the Kingston Inner Harbor and the proposed federal project. And that includes the 2014 RMC report, as well as the information that's been provided to the city by uh, the federal agencies on their proposed Inner Harbor project. Um, I think we've spoken about most of the items that are in, in the report. Um, the main reason for the report is to um, enable this conversation we're having tonight so that Keith can formulate questions uh, and comments that um, can be delivered to the uh, EITP committee on uh, September the 28th 
Um, staff will be providing a report to that EITP committee and our report will include um, some of the questions and comments that have been uh, that, that, that have been and will be discussed at uh, tonight's Keef meeting, uh, as well as any follow up from this meeting. So that's an opportunity for Keefe to have their questions and comments um, that, that you want to have asked of the federal agencies um, presented to e the EITP committee. So um, yeah, that's that's the purpose of the report. Um, like I said, it provides a very high level overview of the various pieces of information that are available. Um, happy to answer questions uh, uh, with uh, Tamsin and anybody else who might have information about what uh, Keith members are, are curious about and the direction you want to see and the type of information you want to receive from the federal agencies so that we have a better understanding of what they're proposing to do. So it's uh, back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to go not, uh, I've got my video off just because as I said, I'm losing some internet connection here. So I'm hoping that might help. Are there any questions about the report? Yes, Mr. Dakin. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple things. Uh, one general observation and then a comment I did want to share on, on behalf of the Conservation Authority, Cataraqui Conservation. Um, first, in terms of general observation, um, and, and it speaks a bit to, to what Tamsin and, and Ken um, were addressing as it relates to the shallow water depth and um, potential resuspension and, and, and kind of continued disturbance and, and how that needs to be considered, I think, by, by everyone, especially those perhaps that, that think that, um, you know, natural attenuation may be viable here. Um, the, as I see it, there's going to be increased use, going to be, be increased demand for use um, along the western shore of the Cataraqui River. Um, you know, if we've learned anything from, from COVID, it's that natural open space, parks, um, water bodies are, are extremely high demand. Um, and, and we know there's populations um, along the Western shore that, that, that want a local area to, to be able to recreate. Uh, we know there's, there's groups that, that wish to swim and have more formal swimming access in, in that location. So I think it's, it speaks to the need um, to look at re remediation, more wholesome re remediation, especially knowing that, uh, you know, fishing, swimming, those sort of uh, activities are, are already occurring and more than likely they're going to be, um, they're going to continue to, to grow in, in terms of demand. Um, so that's just a general observation. Um, putting on my CRCA hat, um, and we have had preliminary discussions with uh, the two project proponents, Transport Canada and Parks Canada. Um, but as as a comment, I, I believe for, for the city and, and the project consultants as well, our project proponents as well, um, there is some concern about what we've seen initially. And I, we know it's very high level um, from the Golder uh, report uh, in terms of remediation options specific to potential revetment along the Western shore. Um, so there'd be rock riprap or, or some sort of rock, rock material actually abutting the shoreline. And, and again, we know this is really early stages and, and it's a comment that needs to be made Transport Canada, but knowing that some of that revetment overlaps with some of the, the city's water uh, lots, um, there is concern about what that would, um, how that would impact uh, riparian areas, existing riparian areas, especially the transition of um, species, wildlife species to and from the water. We know it's a critical area for, for different li life processes for, for those species. We know there's tons of turtle habitat in there, so that certainly needs to be considered. Um, and, and we imagine it will be uh, as part of the impact assessment. Also, and, and this came up with the third crossing as well, um, from a coastal processes perspective, whenever you're hardening a shoreline, um, there is the potential for, for impacts either upstream or downstream because of that hardening. And, and that's something that we would also caution, uh, again, the city and, and uh, the proponents to, to consider 
Um, from initial discussions, we understand they, they would be looking at sort of a hydraulic and, and uh, coastal policies to process uh, assessment to make sure that uh, you know you don't get uh, erosion and sediment and deposition up and up and down the, the river there. Um, you know, um, deflected waves, that sort of thing. It, it all falls within the gra the grand grand um, scope of, of work and assessment that needs to be done. But we want to ensure that that those are uh, those are addressed. So, no specific questions for for staff at this point, and and we're happy to you know provide further comments uh, as an organization um, as things move to EITP. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Doherty. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. Um, I wonder if Mr. McClatchy could go over, um, just explain uh, what report are we, is, is what material from Keith as well as from um, the city council meeting, what will you present to EITP or will that, will all of the questions that you've heard in the last few meetings on this topic, uh, you've gathered all of those questions, uh, I assume. Um, so will you be just uh, giving them a report or will those questions actually be asked at the EITP meeting or are you going to send them ahead of time for them? to know that these are the questions that we would like addressed. So um, thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. It's our intention to provide a staff report to the EITP committee um, that provides an overview of the discussion that has happened since April the 6th. So those are the discussions that happened at council and now the discussion that's happening in a, happening at Keefe, as well as some, as, as much as we know of the communities um, response to the, uh, the federal proposal. Uh, and within that report, probably most importantly, what we want to be able to do is to set out the questions and comments that we've heard from Keefe. So that uh, I, I, know, I know that Keefe is, has been specifically invite, invited by council to uh, participate in the EITP meeting. So I suppose it is a bit redundant, but nevertheless, we would like to have a formal um, written account of the questions and comments that we've received from Keith on this matter so that uh, at the EITP meeting um, all the EITP members are aware of those as well as Keith is able to speak to them. Um, we have requested additional information from the federal agencies and we've asked them to, to uh, give that to us so that we can add it to a staff report. Um, uh, so that uh, the information that the federal agencies are going to present at EITP isn't um, isn't brand new, if you know what I mean. So so that EITP members have some uh, ability to 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 look at it and and formulate new questions, perhaps based on what uh, based on what's there. And we hope to have we hope to have that information in that report as well. Um. Thank you for that. So will Keith be considered uh, actually like a member of the EITP committee at that time or will Keith be more like a delegation or a member of the I'm public? Gonna, I'm gonna ask uh, Elizabeth Fawcett to chime in on this because we have discussed this and uh, I'm not a process expert on this, but uh, I believe EITP can um, allow the Keith chair or whoever's representing Keefe to uh, to act as an EITP member. Is that correct, Elizabeth? Uh, through, through you, Mr. Chair, um, the, the idea would be that um, there are a number of ways that Keefe could um, participate in the EITP. One would be that um, members of the committee could join the meeting as um, members of the public. Each would be able to ask their own questions independently um, as members of the public will be during that meeting. Uh, there was also discussion that the uh, chair of Keefe being um, the member who would be uh, 
eligible to speak on behalf of the committee, should they um, consent to it, would be that um, they could appear at, similar to a visiting counselor to be able to ask questions um, along with the KEEF members. They wouldn't have any voting privileges as they are not a member of EITP. However, they would be able to um, be on the floor to ask the questions during the business item and the briefing as well. So there's a, a couple of different options there um, and uh, discussions will have to um, be had with the chair of EITP before that's um, determined. Thank you. And, and I guess perhaps Keith needs to have a discussion tonight and what we would prefer. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, uh, if um, members of Keith have a um, particular opinion on which way they would like to participate, that would be good to hear and we can, um, we can determine going forward what would be the best course of action. Thanks. Does anybody have a specific form that they'd like? This to uh, us to take, Dr. Lang? Yeah, I'll just put this out here that um, I think there would be value in us coming up with a list of questions from Keith and presenting that um, as Keith's position. Um, I think then it doesn't kind of, kind of get lost in the shuffle. Um, so I would put my weight to that approach. Um, I would ask whether there's still the possibility of, of individual members sitting in as members of the public, but I do think there's value having a key list of questions. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Councillor Doherty. Not a question, but just a comment to, uh, and maybe it is a question uh, to the clerk. Uh, so if if the the chair is part of EITP, I assume we can still have key members there as public members, and public members get a chance to ask questions at the end too. Correct. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I'm uh, sorry, Councillor Doherty. Could you just uh, clarify the question for me? Sure. So uh, if Mr. Stock is part of the EIT, officially kind of, semi-official, whatever, a part of the EITP committee, we can still have, uh, of course, Keefe members can still be members of the public. So we can have both. So Mr. Stocks can have our questions ready and any other question that may come up as we hear more information, the Keefe members could raise those questions at the end when the public gets an opportunity to ask questions. Through you, Mr. Chair, that, that is correct. Yes, we could, both both options would be available and, and simultaneously correct, yeah. Perfect, thanks. Councillor Neal? Oh, sorry, Councillor Doherty, did you have a follow-up? No. No, I'm good, thank you very much. Councillor Neal? Yes, um, just to comment, um, we need to, Keep in mind that if we're giving committee status to an, somebody who hasn't been appointed by our nominations committee, we have to do that by motion and it'll need a two thirds majority uh, of, of the committee. And two thirds is, uh, I don't know what two thirds of five is. I'm a drama teacher, not a math teacher but it's, it's a substantial number. So, so keep that in mind. If you may want to just go with uh, Keith being recognized as members of the public, which you always are at any committee. So. Councillor Doherty. Um, thank you, Chair, and through you, I guess that's a question for Elizabeth. I think this is a different situation because Keith was actually uh, invited into this conversation by council um, that this is kind of a little bit of a new, 
or, or a slightly adjusted process. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? Uh, thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that, that is correct, Councilor Doherty, as Keith has been um, invited to EITP from Council. It is a slightly different situation. The chair is the spokesman for the committee. Um, as long as there's no outright objection from the committee um, with that, with the chair sitting and representing the committee, it, it would be um, allowable on consent of the committee in order for that to happen. Should, should, should you go that route? Should the chair wish to, to hold that, that seat? Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so if I may suggest, I think it would be really good and maybe we could help you, uh, help the chair um, and gather all the questions and maybe Mr. McClarty can help with that too. And uh, uh, we're there as a team to help out too, but it would be, I think it would be helpful if you were there around the table with the EITB as well as other people like me. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to comment, but I would agree. I think we've got lots of great expertise around the table that we would want there to be able to ask those questions and work together as a team, yes. Mr. Dakin. Yeah, sure. Just through you, Mr. Chair, just a quick question uh, just for Paul, I suppose. Um, I'm wondering if, if Paul feels like he's got enough to go on from our, our general comments and questions from this meeting or, or, or if he would like written comments. And, and if so, uh, I'm sure there's a deadline involved. Wondering when that would be. Sure. Thanks. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have a list of questions and comments that I've noted here. Uh, and I think that's probably the meat of it. But uh, what I would like to do is I would like to compile those, provide them to Keith members through the committee clerk uh, for comment and potential addition. Um, and then uh, once I have feedback uh, within some amount of time, I'm gonna say, you know, a, a few weeks, then uh, I'll be able to place that into a staff report to EITP in time for the September 28th meeting. I think that sounds, sounds reasonable. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Somebody on the street. Um, Letty. Elizabeth, um, is this the point that we're going to invite anybody from the public to make comments? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, through you, um, this would be an excellent point um, to include the public. I, I do note that we have four members of the public with us currently, and we do already have one hand raised. Um, before going to that member, though, um, I just wanted to, to remind those who are joining us that they will need to use the raise hand function in Zoom in order for us to call on you. So that can be located in the center of the screen when you move your mouse over the Zoom window. Um, just a reminder, Mr. Chair, that members of the public do have five minutes in which to speak, and we do ask that they provide all of their comments at one time during that. So um, with uh, your permission, Mr. Chair, I'm going to ask um, Jeffrey Jackman if he'd like to unmute and uh, address the committee. Uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Lang. Did I understand you correctly that there, there is no water problem in the inner harbor? The water quality is fine? Great, I'm muted. Um, it's mostly good in comparison to environmental guidelines. Elizabeth, another question? Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't see any other hands. Perhaps I can just do another call um, to the members uh, who are sorry to the members of the public who are joining us this evening. If there's anyone who wishes to ask any questions, um, provide any comments on the discussion this evening, if you could please raise your hand in Zoom so that we may call on you. Mr. Chair, I'm just going to give about 30, 30 seconds or so just to, to make sure that we don't miss anyone before we move forward. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any hands, so we can return to the committee if they have any um, further questions or final comments before moving on to the next business item. Any further questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on, uh, business 8B, Mr. Healy, I think might want to speak to this one. Unmute, Roger. Okay, there. Sorry. Um, sorry, uh, I don't have the agenda in front of me. Is this uh, the report card? Correct. Yes, Native this is uh, the Kingston Environment Advisory. Yeah, 2020 report card. Okay. Um, you know, as, as part of um, the, 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 one of the chair's duties is to summarize what we, have, what we attended to in the prior year. And, and it was put together 99% um, by, I believe, James Thompson uh, before he, he, he uh, uh, moved to another pos position so, as clerk. So, I, I think what you see there is, is uh, I hope, a, a pretty good accounting of what we had done. And uh, with respect to, so, so it's there, if there's any comments or concerns, uh, I think it should just move forward as is. But if, um, uh, if the, uh, maybe I could ask uh, uh, Mr. McClatchy about, um, the state of environment report card, as I, as I understand it, it's kind of the new draft about to show up or, or is there another draft or where is it at? Could you just explain it? Sure, thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first thing I have to do is apologize for the lateness of the whole state of environment report initiative. Um, it was going reasonably well. Uh, I hate to blame stuff on COVID, but because of COVID, we lost our interns who were, uh, who were the engine behind that. Uh, I have been uh, trying to get to that. I hope to have that wrapped up certainly before the end of this year. Back to Keith. Okay, uh, I, are, there, are there any other, should, is there another question to, about that? Okay, um, can I just use this opportunity yeah. to maybe, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, welcome our newest member. She's been here all along. Yes, Emily uh, we did do that. Uh, I don't think she was connected though. Hi, it's, it's uh, really nice, I am. nice to meet everybody. Hi, I'm Emily Monroe, just trying to get my bearings here tonight, but um, a really informative presentation and uh, looking forward to the next meeting. Great. Welcome. Thank you. So um, through the uh, clerk, so this is a report that um, must be, a, we approve it or, and the summary. So should we have a motion and seconder and approve this to go forward? 
Uh, that is correct, Mr. Chair. Um, however, before we go to, to move and second it, I would just uh, recommend if we could just go to the members of the public as it was part of the agenda and it is a formal business item, we should allow members of the public an opportunity to speak to it should they wish. Uh, we still do have two members of the public present, so perhaps we could just give them an opportunity to raise their hand should they have any questions about the report. I'm just going to give a, another 30 seconds. Again, for those who are joining us, the raise hand um, button is located in the center of your screen. And I'm not seeing any hands, Mr. Chair, so we can go ahead and, and uh, start the motion. Okay. Um, do I have a motioner and a, and a seconder? I would I would move that we accept Mr. Healy's. Do I get to vote? No, I don't get. To, do I get to do that? Sorry, Mr. Chair. I did see that Councillor Neal had his hand raised as as a mover, and then we will just need a seconder, and then and then we can call the vote. Uh, Ms. McClary, and I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Sorry, am I, am I still freezing? No. No, Mr. Chair, you're not. I did see that um, the vote did carry. Thank you. Um, so moving on, are there any motions? There are, there are none, Mr. Chair. Seeing or notices of motion. Um, any other business? Correspondence? Um, seeing none, the date for our next meeting, that will be determined, I believe, through the clerk and through Mr. McClatchy. Um, is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chair. There, um, it will be determined at a later date. I did see that Councillor Doherty just had, a, had her hand raised. I'm wondering if she had a question on that. Yeah, thank you, and to you, Madam Clerk. But I do have a question. So I was quite surprised that this is the first meeting we've had all year. So what's the like? What's the process for the Keith Group? Uh, do do we need to wait for a report from staff for us to meet, or what determines uh, whether we meet or not? Because there's lots to talk about when it comes to environmental issues. I can, I can start the uh, response to that. So Keefe can meet um, in response to work that's been delegated to it by council or EITP. Uh, they can meet in response to requests from staff to have Keefe address a specific issue. Uh, or Keefe can meet uh, as part of the regular business. Um, let's say, for example, like the state of environment report or some other piece of regular business that Keefe is uh, involved in. And Keith can also meet um, at the call of the chair if there's a pressing pressing matter that fits within the mandate of the committee. Great, thanks. That's good. Um, so just to follow up on that, Mr. McClatchy, um, so if members of Keith feel that there's a need for us to meet, they could do that through me in, in an email and then I would do that through you and the clerk. That's my understanding, yeah. And uh, I would only suggest that uh, you ensure that the that the uh, the matter that's being met about is within the mandate of the committee. Okay, right. Councillor Neal, I believe you had your hand up. 
Sorry, Mr. Chair, if I could just, um, if I just could just clarify um, Mr. McClatchy's response there. Uh, in terms of um, being able to have the committee come to together, there does need to be business and business is um, pro provided to the committee on the agenda through either a staff recommendation um, or a motion from a committee member. Therefore, there are um, uh, timelines around when uh, motions need to be provided as well as um, it does need to fall within the, the mandate of the committee in order for it to appear on the agenda. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Councillor Neal. Yes, just really quickly. Um, that was a good question from Councillor Doherty. There has been some criticism in the past both with Keith and with housing and homelessness that uh, we would go for months without a meeting when clearly there were issues that were within the purview of those committees. So the call of the chair indeed can be requested from members of the committee uh, who have identified an issue that they'd like to have an opportunity to address. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any Nathan. other comments? I think Nathan has oh, his hand up. Mr. Splinter. I had my sneaky hand up there. Um, I was wondering if uh, we could circulate the uh, the mandate. I think we've got some new members, and so if we could circulate that to all, and then um, if we could also circulate some of the um, the protocols around bringing forward a motion, as well, so everyone's aware of the point the, the process, that would be great. So just a request um, to to send that around. I'm sure it's on a City of Kingston website somewhere, but um, I'd I'd appreciate just a quick email with that. Uh, to refresh uh, all members on on the uh, the mandate and the uh, the timelines around motions. Thank you. The chair would also appreciate that. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, um, I'd ask for a mover and seconder for adjournment. Rachel and Roger, all those in favor? Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>